working on the recording, so watch what you say. Yeah, sorry, <laughs> we don't want to say don't say. Yeah. yeah, we don't want to say anything there. So good evening or good day, whenever this is that anybody is watching it, but it's a good evening for us here. And it's uh, Thursday, March 23rd. It's uh, the study of the Apostles' Creed, picking up from where we may have ventured into it a little bit, but getting in as much as we can this evening, as it is a big study all in itself. It was interesting. The Sunday session I had was uh, quite different than the Wednesday session I had, because questions just went in different directions. We'll see what happens with, with you tonight. And we, um, and in both those sessions, we managed to uh, delve into what is the essence of the Apostles' Creed and, and what it means to us. To uh, begin with prayer this evening, if you turn to, the, if you have your catechism, I want to pray Luther's evening prayer. It's on the back cover of the small one. I don't know where it might be in your book, Steve. You might want to look on with Jan if you don't find it right away. Let's pray together. Oh, come on, Lana. <clears throat> yeah, we were just going to pray Luther's evening prayer. It's on the back cover of the little small catechism. On the front cover is uh, Luther's morning prayer. They're uh, similar in ways, but of course morning is different than evening, so there are different things to pray about. So, together. We give thanks to you, Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have this day so graciously protected us. We beg you to forgive us all our sins and the wrong which we have done. By your great mercy, defend us from all the perils and dangers of this night. Into your hands we commend our bodies and souls and all that is ours. Let your holy angels have charge of us. Let the wicked one have no power over us. Amen. Good. Are you familiar with it? And if you're not, I, I hope you, you would become familiar with it. That's in the Lutheran Book of Prayer, too. Now, yeah, in the Lutheran Book of Prayer, it's mm -hmm. in our worship book and in, in the prayers. So there is, a, I call it a mastery or an artfulness to, to Luther's writing, mm -hmm. and especially this prayer. And as we read the explanations of the Apostles' Creed tonight, too. Hello, Mark. You found us. Mm -hmm. Get yourself settled in. We were just asking if you were coming. Yes. This yeah. week, yeah. Mm -hmm. Since I missed Sunday. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now we just prayed Luther's evening prayer, okay. and I'm, I'm remarking on Luther's style, his language, and what he incorporates in this prayer. And, and the last sentence is the same as the last sentence of the morning prayer that he refers to the angels. Let your holy angels have charge of us. Let the wicked one have no power over us. The angels and the wicked one are very much in the, the worldview of Luther and probably in our worldview too, if we consider it uh, deeply enough or uh, Maybe a lot of people in the 21st century is don't think about angels at all, or don't uh, think of evil of being uh, Satan or, or the devil, or as Luther puts it here, the, the wicked one. And of course, it was written in German, first of all, and wicked one. I can pull out of uh, a mighty fortress, uh, uh, the uh, the alt beza find is what he says the old evil fool, uh, so that's the German and I, I think that would be what it is here for Luther's prayer. So we uh, we do contend with uh, the wickedness of the world, just can't help but see that it's around us. You watch the news, you see what happened in London yesterday, what happens in an ongoing way and many nations and just you know, it's a very troubling world to live in and Luther knew that 
And in his time, it was even more superstitious about what was evil and how um, evil was out to get you. And, um, and Luther brought the Reformation about so that those who were, were suffering in that way, or, uh, just had fears, uh, could turn to God and find comfort. Uh, it was lost in the, the centuries before Luther, before the Reformation, and it was the, the sense that God would comfort you and that God wasn't the, the source of all these uh, these evils and sufferings and things that go bump in the night that, uh, that scare you, and especially dying uh, would scare you intensely because uh, you see the artwork of the time and wood cuttings and paintings and the, the demons are just hovering above the one who is dying and ready to snatch their soul. And that was so much in, in people's minds that the, the true joy of the gospel is that we don't have that to contend with. Uh, Jesus has cared for us in such a way that uh, there is, they have no power over us. And there are holy angels over us. When I mean, you think of angels on your own, having guardian angels, the reality of angels, uh, occasionally we will. There certainly are scripture stories, verses that uh, bring that to mind. The, uh, the modern person generally isn't going to be too concerned about what angels are, are doing. The, Luther uh, was, and Luther was aware of it, and we draw that from Scripture. Uh, uh, studying angels, that could be a, a big study all in its, itself, and we're not here to do that. I'm just sort of remarking on the, the style of language and the way Luther can draw us in with the, the way he writes about uh, spiritual realities and gospel matters and uh, the God of life. So angels... Uh, are, are part of, part of um, well, we just had the gallery, and you know, how many angels were there? Mm -hmm. Lots and lots of angels. Mm -hmm. Was Luther German? Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. oh, okay, I thought he was, but mm -hmm. for some mm -hmm. reason, I don't know why I thought about mm -hmm. it, but it just entered my mind that Luther was a German man. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, of course, the one that founded our faith, but mm -hmm. our, well, our, 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 uh, the nomination, I guess. Well, yeah. Mm. Okay. And the Refor Reformation springs from Germany, and he was thoroughly German, down to his love of beer. Yeah. <laughs> uh, now the angels in our gallery and in the artwork that it's based on are girls. You know, the, you know, the girls around here really wait and, and long for that day they can be an angel in the gallery. Um, but the angels that uh, get mentioned by name in scripture are, do you know who they are? Gabriel. Gabriel, who's a messenger to Mary. Okay. And uh, in Revelation, there's Michael. 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 Michael, yeah, he is the, the leader of God's army. And I would think Gabriel and Michael are probably gender male names. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so they're both uh, archangels in the hierarchy of angels. Archangels are a lot of about angels comes in the uh, the Jewish writing between the testaments, and they they come up with seven archangels, and I can't remember all seven, and I can never remember the seven dwarves or the eight <laughs> reindeer. So I, I'm not going to remember the Raphael is uh, is another one I re I remember. Uh, they are names that for the most part, if not all of them, you know, uh, Michael and Michael and Hebrew, so there's that L at the end, which means God. That's uh, Michael, uh, Gabriel. Um, so it has something to do. Angel itself, the word means messenger. Mm -hmm. And it comes from the, the Greek word, which means messenger, angelo. And what else can we say about angels? Um, I was asked yesterday, where does, where does the idea of uh, guardian angels come from? And there are... Well, we can go to Jesus' temptation in the wilderness, and he responded to the um, uh, temptations of, of Satan by uh, quoting scripture, Satan threw scripture at him, uh, and the one where he's on top of the pinnacle of the temple and 
you know, throw yourself off because doesn't God say uh, he will have his angels guard you, defend you, so that your foot shall not um, stub against a stone, strike a, a stone, so that when it's not misused by Satan that way, that's a, that's a comforting message. And think about at the end of the temptation when Satan leaves him, and the, uh, the gospel writers say, and then the angels came and ministered to him. So after those 40 days in the wilderness and facing that temptation, he, he needed that, that heavenly angel, tender, loving care. Angels are, are not human beings, and human beings don't become angels. Uh, angels are part of pre-creation. They were with God at creation part of the heavenly council that uh, existed before all this was brought into being. Um, oh, another good example would be the Garden of Gethsemane, as we're in the Lenten time, and that will be coming up soon. And Jesus prayed so fervently that this cup would pass from him, and it was uh, determined. Uh, the, the strength of the prayer was, uh, not my will, but your be, yours be done. And uh, the angels came and ministered to him. So we've got uh, loving angels round about us, a little strength from heaven in addition to uh, well, what we'll see in the Apostles' Creed, the Holy Spirit and the way Jesus is present and the way God the Father cares for us, the Creator cares for us. Of course, we call Satan the fallen angel. Yes, he is a fallen <laughs> angel. And he was, he was part of that, that heavenly council. That's what the book of Job has to say about him. He had as much access to God as any of the, the angels, and his role was to be the accuser. He's, he's the one who goes around and sees what we're up to and the, the bad we do and the mistakes we make and, and reports back to God and you know, see what Marcus did and did you how did you not see that and what are you doing about that? And the guy goes, okay, yes, I knew. <laughs> Just let me carry on. I knew, uh, I knew what he was going to do before he even did it. Yes. That way. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's the way angels can operate. So having gone on that, down that little road, uh, the, the starting point of that was uh, how I at least enjoy Luther's language. And then there is that language throughout the small catechism. And I re regret that as the small catechism gets studied, I get the sense that the explanations of the, the articles of the catechism do not get so much attention as they may have when, when I was a youngster, and back in the, the classic days of confirmation class. And, you know, for, for better or worse, you know, I learned a few things. The Apostles' Creed uh, brings to us God as, as Trinity, the three persons. And persons was a word that was uh, used in early Christianity because it, it had some philosophical overtones to it that, that everybody could agree to. Uh, we know what person means for ourselves. You know, that person is, is over there, or I'm a person, and but there is something about personhood, might better describe it. There is a personhood to each of us, too. And <clears throat> that um, includes all, all the qualities that we are, that we're composed of, that we're recognized by, that we utilize. And that just translates uh, helpfully into calling Father, Son, and Holy Spirit persons of God, as they each have their individual qualities and uh, identifying marks. Trinity is uh, the name that applies to that. It's got that uh, threefold sense to it with the tri. Tri is a prefix that means three, tricycle, and other tri things that you might come across. Um, but it's not a, a biblical word. It's just something used to, a word that came into common use to uh, let us know that we're, we're talking about Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, a convenient word, and it uh, 
made its way into the common parlance and uh, used in the theology. So there was three persons, our Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and they're uh, to condense what their, their work is as God and the way that we experience God would be Father would be Creator and Son is Redeemer and Holy Spirit is Sanctifier. Uh, sanctifier, I see, doesn't get used as much as when I was learning. Maybe it's a little more complicated word. It refers to holiness, sanctification, and so forth. And so I've, I've seen uh, empower probably being a, a word that uh, fits very well to what the Holy Spirit does. Okay. So Luther approached this, and he had uh, knowledge of a whole a lot of history of discussion about how the Holy Spirit, not just the Holy Spirit, how the Trinity is uh, is God, and we are worshiping and acknowledging not three gods, but one God. It is always a, a battle within Christianity to have that explained to the, the world around us, the non-Christian world, to uh, you know, particularly the Jewish world, which uh, stresses so much that uh, God is, is one and the same with Islam, and to uh, separate us from uh, the pagan world that was polytheistic and just made sense to, to pagan minds, uh, ancient or contemporary, that there are a lot of things going on that uh, why not say there's a God behind all of that. Uh, the storm coming in tonight is uh, controlled by a God. And, there's a God that causes the seeds to turn into plants. So why not, uh, why not think that way? You know, uh, God revealed himself as um, different than that. Um, and that's uh, embracing that one true God that uh, we don't get divided and we don't get uh, distracted into a whole lot of um, you know, superstition and uh, and confusion about uh, who's who loves us and who controls our lives and, and who we can worship and uh, who we can count on so, okay so I didn't mention it and I probably didn't but the the Apostles Creed uh, can be traced back to a, a creed uh, early in Christianity in the, that second century of Christianity called the, the Roman Creed or the Old Roman Creed. And some clearly uh, distinctive expressions of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And as things come out new, and they get refined over time and they get uh, built and then um, expanded some so the the explanation improves and there isn't a, a lot of difference between the old Roman Creed and what we now call the Apostles Creed uh, but there are some significant things um, one example let's see um, talked about it yesterday oh yeah in the second article that Jesus was uh, was crucified, died, and uh, descended into where? Hell. Hell. Into hell. Mm -hmm. uh, the old Roman creed just said he was died and was buried, and he rose again. So it didn't bring up the matter of what happened after that human death. Um, it became important to those who were, were teaching the faith and those who, who went into what scripture has to say uh, to say that uh, he also either descended to hell or the other phrase now is uh, descended to the dead. Now that's not a new phrase. Um, uh, for those of us of uh, Lutheran history, including I grew up in Missouri Senate, so you know I've got that in my background, right. that we uh, uh, grew up my generation, probably your generation, I don't know how far back, but we learned it was the Holy Christian Church. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And here in what are the predecessor bodies of our, our ELCA, we had the Red Hymnal. 
I want to say you had the red hymnal because I grew up in Missouri Synod and we had the blue hymnal, the Lutheran hymnal, mm -hmm. and it said the Holy Christian Church. When the red hymnal gave way to the green hymnal, then it became the Holy Catholic Church, Catholic with a small c. And that, I, I don't think I've had any more questions about anything than I have about why do we say Catholic? And Catholic means universal, includes everyone who's Christian. So the same idea as Christian, but it uh, it's a more particular word that goes back to the Latin and the the concept of what uh, church was, that uh, the Catholicity of being Christian is is not about a denomination, the Roman Catholic Church, uh, which was the Catholic Church because uh, they were the only church up to the Reformation, except for the Eastern Orthodox Church, but that, that really doesn't get pulled into the discussion of uh, what is what uh, Catholicism means. So they've always been the Catholic Church, and my suspicion, I don't know the exact reason for it, but my suspicion is that uh, translated into English, Catholic was originally the term that was used that uh, was the best translation of what the, the Latin was. And as uh, Lutherans in the various uh, subtle and not so subtle ways wanted to make sure they weren't thought to be Catholic and didn't want to identify with Catholics, they threw out that word Catholic and they inserted Christian, which is okay. a perfectly proper That's what word. I've, I've gotten here. Uh, so the he Holy Christian Church. Mm -hmm. This is the NIV. Um, version. So the way you teach the class, because I know he's going to attend the class on Sunday for membership. Mm -hmm. I'm going to come with him in, but so you're kind of, you're going to, I guess, I don't know how to ask this. Um, so he will learn the ELCAs, e -L -C ELCA. ELCAs. Yeah, we are the, the Evangelical Lutheran Church, Church in America. Right, and so it's a little bit different mm. from a little bit different. Center. I don't mm. understand, and I'm not difference. even finished mm. yet. <laughs> so there's there's <laughs> more. <laughs> but um, that's a whole course on the topic. Oh yeah, <laughs> it's, uh, the whole. Oh, it is. Oh, yeah, I didn't the, know that those the, the were two whole, separate things. The family um. tree of, of worship <laughs> books, and um, mm -hmm. yeah, and what the membership class will be. It's not going to be heavy on. Um, what we're talking about here, it's going to be about knowing the church and being familiar. And just, um, you know, if you've uh, been to worship as you have been, and you've, you've got Lutheran background too, that we know uh, you're you're probably pretty well set. Um, but we also know that we do offer Bible studies, and we do have pastors available for one-on-one. -on -one instruction or uh, anybody can you know every once in a while I get an email or I get something on the back of a yellow card it says you know what can I talk to you about this or they just want a, a simple answer hmm? uh, I don't know what I'm doing I don't think so so yeah it's a two hour class yeah I think uh, yeah well, we're, we're just trying to keep it uh, to be finished by 2 or 2.30, so we don't wear people out. Um, so don't, there, there's nothing, you're not going to be examined or <laughs> tested. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> um, see, that was, that was a frightening thing, too, in my confirmation growing up, is that the Sunday before confirmation was examination Sunday. Mm -hmm. When we, we each got asked by the pastor a certain question or two, and we had to answer before the whole congregation. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, you remember that? Oh, uh, yeah. Boy, that was, oh, really? oh, oh, that was a sleepless yeah. night the night before. Oh, <laughs> and you think you really have it down pat, and all of a sudden <clears> you're <throat> sitting out there yeah. next to your parents and the pastor. Mm -hmm. Oh, Steve, can you come up here? What's no, what do they do if you answered it wrong? Oh, no. I don't know. Uh, no, they don't. It was, yeah, there was a lot of grace involved. <laughs> <laughs> but he, had, he actually had me lead the whole church mm -hmm. in the Apostles' Creed. Oh. And I could not get into the hymnal. I had to know it up here. Mm -hmm. I knew it. 
Yes. Oh, I was going to say, didn't they let you use a cheat sheet? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because that was one of the parts of your communion. Mm -hmm. You know, and that yeah. was to know that. Yeah. So when was the Apostles' Creed formalized? Well, it was recognized first in the form that we have. It was uh, in the 600s, and it was used in Germany and France. So that doesn't mean it didn't exist before. It's when those who realized, oh, we're using this, and a lot of Christians are using this. You know, where did it come from? And those who had the energy were scholarly enough to go back. They said, well, here, here's where it was first used that we can find. So in between the 200s with the old Roman creed and the, the 600s, where it, it started getting called commonly the Apostles' Creed, that's, uh, there were uh, manifestations of it in between, and generally just uh, the, the same teaching and the, the same consistency with uh, the true Christian faith, the Holy Catholic Church, the Holy Catholic faith, that it becomes a, um, a universal uh, so one other thing I was going to add as I was going through the worship books as, as they evolved, now we have uh, a red book, but it's really a cranberry book. So, oh, there it is. So, and uh, way over there on the end, those are the, uh, the old, yeah, we've got it right in order. There's the red book, there's the green book, there's the cranberry book. And that was the one back in the mid-60s, wasn't it? Uh, which one? The red the, the one that they're using right now. Oh, the one yeah. we're using right now, no, 2006. What's it? Yeah. I must be talking it just about passed its 10th anniversary. Okay. And yeah, the Green Book in 1978. Okay, because I had uh, an uncle that was on the uh, board that actually uh, set up the uh, Red Hymnal. Mm. And that was done there in Bonn, West Germany. Uh -huh. So as we get to the Cranberry Book, we're still saying the Holy Catholic Church, but we are switching from uh, He Descended to Hell to He Descended to the Dead. Now if I grab a green one and I turn to the Apostles' Creed in the Green Book, where it says He Descended to Hell, there's an asterisk there. And at uh, the bottom of the page it says, or to the dead. Mm. Oh. So that's been common language for ancient and ancient times. And there hasn't been an agreement on whether it's to hell or to the dead. And with th this one now, it's just switched. We've got uh, he descended to the dead with the asterisk there and down below it says, or to hell. Mm. You know, the, the literal word hell is just sort of a, a, an English language construct. And whether where Jesus descended after he died, we don't have anything scriptural except one uh, reference. And if you, uh, I can barely remember, but we, we studied Peter, and I can't remember. And this is the third time I've said it. I can't remember if it's First Peter or Second Peter. I should actually just look it up so I'd know. But in First Peter or Second <laughs> Peter, it says Jesus. Uh, went and he, uh, he preached to the spirits in prison. So that's the one reference we have to Jesus going to the place of the dead. And prison is uh, the word there. So when we say he went to the dead, we're really borrowing from the Old Testament, where the Hebrew word for the place of the dead is Sheol. And uh, there's really no um, expanded... Uh, explanation of what happens to us after we die and uh, the the Jews the Hebrews weren't all that concerned about it they just know that we live this life and uh, you try to be faithful to God you've got the law you're God's chosen people and you give glory to God and your fulfillment in life is is following that law and loving God and loving your neighbor as yourself is the best way to follow it and when you die, there isn't much concern about what happens when you die. So I, I guess that would include saying there's no fear about what happens to when you die. And uh, the best that uh, the Old Testament offers us is it's a place of the dead. So I think 
using that phrase rather than hell borrows from that, uh, that Jewish understanding, the Old Testament understanding. They're not major things, and they're not things that we are really privy to a lot of uh, insight on because Scripture just doesn't offer us a lot. It's what Jesus did when he was alive and what happened after he died, and then he rose again. Those are the things that matter. But uh, my understanding, uh, I'm kind of jumping ahead by what I want to do because I want to read all these explanations, but while it's on my mind, I'll just say that it's intended uh, to communicate to us uh, in, the, in a strong way that when Jesus died, and crucifixion is far from pleasant. It's a horrid way to die. It's one of the cruelest ways you can put a person to death. And that when he died, even though he was the son of God, he did not escape that uh, condemnation, that pronouncement, uh, that uh, those who, who, uh, who sin uh, will, uh, well, the wages of sin is death, but death is not just a physical death that's being apart from God, having no place with God ever again. And that's the horror of hell, really. So that uh, Jesus experienced that, and he experienced it so he could very literally break the power of hell. That he, uh, you know, I've I try to depict it in, in sermons. Uh, I've had a few sermons where I say um, you know, Jesus came face to face with Satan and said, you, you will not have my people, I'm letting them go. And that's what happened. And that included him, and God raised him from the dead, because in, in his perfection, uh, he did not deserve to be there I, by no way, shape, or manner. And so resurrection was just the natural thing. God said, let's set this right. Uh, my son, uh, human as he was, still was perfect, and he accomplished what I wished every human could do, but they can't, because they, they lost that when they fell into sin in the Garden of Eden. Uh, well, those are uh, ways of it's pointing out what we, we find as we use the Apostles' Creed today in our worship book. And we most commonly use that creed when we are together in worship. And we are, are saying it as a, a demonstration to each other and to the whole world that we, we have the one faith in common. And we're not each coming up with our own faith, and we're not each uh, going off in variations of it. And we are drawn by God into a, a faith in the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and uh, that is the saving faith. We'll say more about that at baptism time, because we are baptized in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Okay, I think I have those things out of my head right now. And what I'd, I'd like to do, which goes back to uh, in praying Luther's prayer, is my appreciation of his language. And uh, I love the, the language of the explanations. So uh, in preface to that, what, uh, what we have in common as Christians is the Apostles' Creed. It's one of the few things that all Christians everywhere can agree on. They truly are, are Christians. And, there are some splinter groups of Christians or Mormonism or something that might call itself Christian, but when you get to the heart of its theology, it, uh, it's gone astray. So Christians have the language of the, the Apostles' Creed in common, but for Lutherans who have Martin Luther in our heritage and his writings, there are, are phrases within these explanations that uh, are, are common insider language for each of us to, to know we're talking about the same thing when uh, we'll see each explanation ends with this is most certainly true. So somebody might be telling me a story about what, uh, what you went through and uh, you know, I'll take you, you Steve, uh, you're going to tell me after a 14 hour shift tomorrow, you're going to be pretty tired. And I could say, this is most certainly true. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's a way of saying amen. That's what amen means. Yeah, yeah, it shall be. So um, I think 
my experience uh, is with pastors a lot, and we we tend to throw those phrases around as uh, the insider things we we know. Uh, but there, are, each one of these explanations this will have, and, and it will mean something different to you as you you know it and read it. And I, I recommend that you um, you kind of keep this around for a part of your your daily devotions or whatever frequency you have devotions that it's not just a devotion book that you might have and so happens our devotion book now during Lent that the church provided you is based on this mm -hmm. that you can come back to this and savor these these words this masterful language that Luther has this artful way of, of describing Okay, so I'm going to ask you now if you would turn to these pages, and uh, we know what the articles of the creed are, but let's read all three of these explanations together. Read along with me. Beginning on page 11, and uh, the first article, I believe in God the Father. Uh, what does this mean? And together, I believe that God has created me and all that exists. He has given me and still preserves my body and soul with all their powers. He provides me with food and clothing, home and family, daily work, and all I need from day to day. God also protects me in time of danger and guards me from every evil. All this he does out of fatherly and divine goodness and mercy though I do not deserve it. Therefore, I surely ought to thank and praise, serve and obey him. This is most certainly true. The order of uh, names of description of God in the article is first Father Almighty and then Creator. But in the explanation, Luther brings out the Creator aspects mostly. He saves the, the fatherly side of things to the end of it. So it's the creator that uh, we, uh, we certainly experience day by day at uh, this table. You know, I can count on this table kind of holding me up. But I've got some expectations out of the table and the, and the water and the air and I breathe the air. Uh, God has created this and it's all for the sake of life. God is a God of life. God loves right, life. God revels in life and, uh, and more and more life. And that God is a creator is the scripture's way of saying this all started someplace. Uh, before this all started, you know, everything that we experience, whether it's closer at hand or out there in the vast expanse of the universe, um, it, it's got a beginning point. And scientifically, yeah, there are various ways of explaining that. And, but uh, scripture says, uh, well, I'm not, the scripture says, I'm not going to tell you how it happened. I'm just going to tell you who is responsible for it, who mm -hmm. is the creator. So if you get that right, then you can go off on your, your scientific studies and just enjoy what. Uh, the, the the laws of the universe are and uh, just be thankful there's such a thing as gravity and, uh, and know that, that God put that all into place and not just out of a whim not just uh, to uh, uh, make you wonder uh, how long is it going to last or can I trust it and uh, no, this, this is uh, the message of scripture that uh, I want this to go on and even though I started it, I didn't, well, I started it and I didn't forget about it. It wasn't just the day's fad. And, uh, you know, I had a little hobby one day speaking as God. And, okay, it's all in place. Now, what else can I do? I'll find something else. stars up there. <laughs> yes, yes. But, yeah. And, and the fact there are stars has something to do with you and me. Or God has us connected to that. Uh, all living under the same creator and seeing to it that once he brought life into being that life can go on 
So we've, we've got food and clothing and, and home and family and all the things we count on and trust in day after day. Uh, the, the bonds we have in family life and the, the society and culture that provides uh, an economy where there are jobs and you can make a, a living. This is uh, meat and potatoes stuff. This is food on the table stuff, uh, roof over our head stuff. And if sometimes it's not there for the homeless um, or any circumstances we have or there's, there's illness, you know, God didn't intend that. God did not create that. This is the, the intrusion of sin, the corruption of sin. And God is in the process of, of battling that and protecting us. So that gets us into the second article about Jesus. But... Um, we are in the hands of a, a loving God and not a, a God who's toying with us or making us wonder what's in store for us tomorrow. If today went all right, but how can I count on tomorrow being okay too? If God can have God's way in every way without sin interfering, then it will be all right. So. Uh, about in the middle of it is the, the matter of protection. God also protects me in time of danger and guards me from every evil. So we, we've got an idea of what kind of protections there can be in life. That uh, little children grow up knowing uh, they have mom and dad or a parent or somebody who's going to teach them. You don't touch the hot stove. and. They're looking out for, you know, what is it now? You know, uh, you shouldn't feed honey to children or things when our kids, my wife and I, when our kids were young, we didn't think about, but mm -hmm. <laughs> we found out. Um, well, there, there are good parenting practices that come into play. Uh, God makes sure that that's there. And even from ancient times, there, there were parents, and even in the anim animal world, you know, the, the maternal instincts and uh, the uh, the interplay of uh, how, how birds, uh, males create nests and uh, those those penguin stories, have you ever watched any of those penguin movies, is what, what it takes to care for that, that egg and then the, the new uh, chick or whatever you call penguins. So that's all there. But I, I also like to remind people and remind myself too and the book of Ephesians is very good at this, and we've studied that too, mm -hmm. that there are things going on in the cosmos, behind the scenes, uh, that, that are evil trying to destroy what God has set in order and structured, uh, that God is protecting us from all the time, and we have no idea what it is. Just don't, don't see all the um, vast... Uh, conspiracies of evil that are, are going on in the spiritual world that God is protecting us from. I think that's worth giving consideration. As rough as life can be in this world, it could probably be a lot worse if uh, all these, these de demonic things broke through. And I don't mean just in the, the, the Hollywood scary movie kind of way, although maybe that's what it's all about. But God uh, is that powerful and evil is that uh, persistent in, in trying to undermine what God has created. That, that God is constantly protecting us. So uh, giving thanks to God is, can even be about uh, the evil that we didn't know was, was trying to get between us and God. And God made sure that didn't happen. And we don't deserve it. So that becomes clear in here too. So this is sort of a, a law gospel matter here. If God, the, the creator, is God uh, operating with law to put structure into our lives and uh, security and protection. And our response to that, Luther suggests, rather strongly, therefore I surely ought to thank and praise, serve and obey him. So that's the right order of things too. God creates, creation gives God the honor. 
thanks and praises, serves and obeys this God and Creator. And this is all on a very personal basis. God isn't just going through the motions and doing this in a very general way. He knows what's going on with your eye and your mouth, and he knows uh, every last thing about what's going on. Uh, God can pay uh, attention to the smallest detail of our lives, even while God is uh, watching the orbits of planets that are circling suns uh, trillions of years, uh, miles, light years away. Good. Anything else about Creator? Let's go to the second article, and we'll read that explanation. Page 13. I believe that Jesus Christ, true God, Son of the Father from eternity, and true man, born of the Virgin Mary, is my Lord. At great cost he has saved and redeemed me, a lost and condemned person. He has freed me from sin, death, and the power of the devil, not with silver or gold, but with his holy and precious blood and his innocent suffering and death. All this he has done that I may be his own, live under him in his kingdom, and serve him in everlasting righteousness, innocence, and blessedness. Just as he is risen from the dead, and lives and rules eternally. This is most certainly true. Jesus Christ. Jesus the name that uh, the angel declared to Mary. Subsequently, Joseph. Uh, he's going to be named Jesus because Jesus is, uh, is Yeshua, which is also Joshua. And it, it literally means God saves. So an appropriate name and a common name in uh, Hebrew culture and the Jewish culture. Christ is the, the title. No, so it's male didn't go to Mr. and Mrs. Christ. Well, no, Mrs., but Mr. Christ. Uh, that's, that's the title. It means Messiah. So Christ is the, the Greek for Messiah and Messiah uh, is the Hebrew for Christ. Look at it that way, which means anointed one, which often means king, because most often it was kings that were anointed. So we, uh, and that's where Christians come from, and it's a, a proper name for for Jesus. So he is uh, truly God, and he is a son of the Father, and that's how we got the the name for God, uh, the fatherly love. It doesn't have to be. Uh, fatherly. Uh, it can be a parent or, or guardian or guide or something too, but uh, for, for ages and ages we know God as Father because Jesus is the Son of God and Jesus called God Father. And the word for Father, and I'm applying this to the first uh, article too, but Jesus used the, the Aramaic word Abba when he talked about God. And we'll hear that next week when we talk about the Lord's Prayer, Our Father who art in heaven. Abba is the equivalent of Daddy in English. So it's the, the personal informal name. Jesus was uh, comfortable and rightfully so to, to call God Abba. And again with the Lord's Prayer, we are invited to do that too, and to know God that creator as a, a father or a parental figure, a loving figure to the, uh, the infant and then the growing child that needs direction and protection, uh, that we are in that kind of relationship. So, but he's truly God and, and truly a human. So being born of the Virgin Mary uh, becomes important in that. That uh, Mary was a virgin indicates that uh, there, there can be no question that uh, power outside of uh, human uh, involvement in the, this uh, conception was there. And so we, we say uh, in the creed itself, uh, it was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit. 
another change in the new worship book is just uh, he was conceived by the Holy Spirit, left the power out. So there, there's probably some debate and argument about, well, do we need power in the, uh, in the green book? The red book didn't have power. The green book did. The new red book doesn't. So somebody is sitting around tables like this and maybe hundreds of tables like this and say, okay, no more power. And they all agree to it. Uh, the Holy Spirit is a power. So maybe it sounds redundant. Uh, Mary, being human, then contributes the, the human side to Jesus. Uh, the Holy Spirit contributes the God side to Jesus. I've been asked uh, in the other sessions, too, uh, we've got the Apostles' Creed, and then along comes the Nicene Creed. And the Nicene Creed is a response to the, the question just how much is God, how much is Jesus God, and how much is Jesus human? Or is Jesus uh, God at all and, and only human, or uh, only God and not human? And so all those ideas and theories are floating around in, in early Christianity. And uh, at the time, or well, the Nicene Creed is a result of the Council of Nicaea, which was called into uh, to take place uh, by the Roman Emperor uh, Constantine, who had legalized Christianity in the Roman Empire. It took place in the year 325, because he was tired of this, this bickering. And he didn't want any divisions in understanding among the Christian church because that was becoming a significant part of his empire, and he didn't want divisions in his empire. So he demanded that uh, all the bishops and the, um, the teachers of the church uh, meet at, at Nicaea and determine once and all, once and for all, what is uh, the proper the uh, orthodox teaching of Jesus, and the. Uh, the proponent of Jesus not being so much God was a man named Arius. And he, uh, he put forward what just makes sense to human beings that you know, God, God wouldn't become a, a, a human being because that sort of taints God, it diminishes God. If you, if you want a God that you can really worship, uh, you don't want that God becoming a human. And that had general acceptance, but it was uh, the other side of the, the argument, the theological argument, was by Athanasius, who said Jesus had to be, be God, and he had to be an entirely human being, too. And it can't be split down the middle. He's got to be both at the same time. Otherwise, we as human beings, we lose the, the promise of salvation. We lose our confidence in our salvation. As uh, you think it through, that to break the power of, of sin and death over us, well, the power of sin is death, to break the power of death over us, it takes uh, a return to the way we were before sin had power over us, and that's when we were perfectly created, as uh, God created Adam and Eve. So, uh, and up to, well, then it was 325 A.D., now it's 2017. Nobody, no human being has lived perfectly. Uh, probably better to, to mention 325, or probably better just to mention the year uh, when Jesus was born, 4 B.C. or whatever they decided he was born before Christ. <laughs> because nobody had lived perfectly, otherwise Jesus wouldn't have had to come. So God said, it's got to be me, myself, God, to live perfectly. So that's, that's the God side of things. We've got to take this power out of uh, sin's hands, and we'll do it with a perfect, uh, perfect living person. So there's the human being side of it, because it has to matter to us. It has to count for us. As, uh, of course, God can keep things perfectly, but could a human being ever do that? Well, this way it can. And so Jesus becomes entirely a human being, experiences everything human beings does, is born as a human being, 
uh, wasn't conceived in the same way, but uh, that birth was very human, and his raising was, and his emotions were, and the temptations were, everything humans experience. Um, his cold and his hunger and his pain were all very human, and then his death was very human. So that when it came to him rising again, then it could truly count for humans too. It wasn't just, okay, well, Jesus gets to rise again because he's God. What good does that do me? Uh, but he was human too. So God said, I count it not just for Jesus, but for everyone. And I'm going to bring it into your lives uh, by baptism. So let me study baptism. We'll just see how that baptism, how we are joined to Jesus in baptism. So his death and resurrection is our death and resurrection. So that's the point here of the Apostles' Creed about Jesus. Um, and the Nicene Creed set that down in terms that uh, settled it pretty well for all of time. There was another creed that came along, the Athanasian Creed, named after this Athanasius guy who stood up for Jesus being true God and true human. But the, the question was more about the Trinity at that time. And... Uh, to my dismay, the new, can you grab me a green worship book? Uh, the red book does not have the Athanasian Creed in it. The green book still did, and previous ones. And if you're not familiar with it, I'll show it to you, to show you, um, yeah, it's rather, it's rather long. And it's um, page 54, it is. Yeah, it's more than one page. This is the Athanasian Creed. Now, I'll read just a, a little bit of it so you get a, a sense of what it is trying to, to settle and resolve. And uh, so, no doubt, uh, this is the Catholic faith. We worship one God in Trinity and the Trinity in unity, neither confusing the persons nor dividing the divine being. For the Father is one person, the Son is another, and the Spirit is still another. But the deity of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is one, equal in glory, equal, uh, co-eternal in majesty. But the Father is, the Son is, and so is the Holy Spirit. Uncreated is the Father, uncreated is the Son, uncreated is the Spirit. The Father is infinite, the Son is infinite, the Holy Spirit is infinite. And it goes on that way for quite a while, just to pound home. <laughs> Let's not get uh, confused or create confusion by somehow declaring we've got uh, three gods. And, and the, uh, the equality of that. And what um, the Gospel of John sets forth, uh, forth as it uh, begins with a, a clear um, indication. It, it wants to repeat what uh, Genesis says uh, in the beginning. Genesis, in the beginning God created the heaven and earth. And John, the Gospel begins, in the beginning the Word became flesh. And John is saying that that word, well, that's Jesus. That uh, sort of gets spelled out in the gospel. And those who, who know the, the word, the logos in Greek, uh, was a, a common determination of a, a divine power. So, uh, so Jesus didn't become a human or the second person of the Trinity didn't become a human till Christmas, till Jesus was born. But the second person of the Trinity was there at creation, as much as God the Father was. And uh, the Spirit is mentioned at creation. The Spirit moved over the waters. Uh, good. Okay, uh, a little bit more about Jesus in just a very short way to help us understand that we have been redeemed. We have been bought back with a price from the power of death, but not with gold or silver. It was his death that accomplished that, something we cannot do ourselves. And the, the joyful result of that is 
that uh, it, it's just simply faith in that trust that God gives that to us as a gift that uh, lets us know we belong to God and we'll never be lost to God. And we have a, a kingdom of righteousness and blessedness to, to help bring into being here on earth as much as it can be until Jesus comes again and to look forward to the time that it is in perfection after Jesus does come and joins heaven and earth uh, as they rightfully should be. And uh, he, will, he will come again. So I don't want to uh, dismiss that or make it seem like less, but uh, that it truly is because I'm going to move on to the Holy Spirit while we've got a little time left and not leave the Holy Spirit out of this. But Jesus will come again. Okay, page 14, and we will read the third explanation. I believe that I cannot, by my own understanding or effort, believe in Jesus Christ my Lord or come to him. But the Holy Spirit has called me through the gospel, enlightened me with his gifts, and sanctified and kept me in the true faith. In the same way, he calls, gathers, enlightens, and sanctifies the whole Christian church on earth and keeps it united with Jesus Christ in the one true faith. In this Christian church, day after day, he fully forgives my sins and the sins of all believers. On the last day, he will raise me and all the dead and give me and all believers in Christ eternal life. This is most certainly true. The Holy Spirit, spirit or wind or breath. The, uh, both the Hebrew word and the Greek word for spirit or wind or breath uh, mean spirit or wind or breath. <laughs> so you can, uh, the old way of saying it was the Holy Ghost Ghost wasn't part of the, the Greek or the Hebrew, so uh, it, it did its job for a long time until in a more contemporary translation, we uh, substituted spirit for, for ghost. And in the, the gospel reading for the Sunday before last, which is John 3, the uh, story of Nicodemus seeking out Jesus to meet him at, at night, and to ask the questions, uh, delve further into what was stirring in him, that he, he saw what Jesus is doing. And he should have been on the, uh, the enemy's side, an enemy to Jesus, but uh, he, couldn't, uh, he couldn't dismiss what Jesus was accomplishing and thought, this has to come from God. And he was, uh, had the, the courage enough to pursue it more when all of, he was, a, he was a leader. He was a, a leader of the, the temple in Jerusalem. And uh, he, uh, he went by night, and we can probably assume because he didn't want to be seen in public with Jesus and be identified with him, or at least not too soon, which would create all kinds of problems for him. Uh, another explanation, just to talk about that, uh, that story itself, too, is... Uh, he met at night because the tradition was the, that rabbis would study at night. Now, Jesus was the rabbi, but Nicodemus was the, the searcher for truth. So that sort of lines up with the way uh, the tradition or the way rabbis were known. They, they did their study at night. So that's another explanation of why Nicodemus went at night. But I think the just the drama of being there, uh, oh, I mean, just... He and Jesus and the, this little conspiracy, this good conspiracy is happening. And he gets to ask, how does this come? Or how can it come to me? And Jesus explains, uh, you're, you're not going to be part of this unless you are born again, or better, is born from above. And how does that happen? We don't jump into mom's womb again. We can't do that. So, well, the water and the spirit will take care of that. Uh, water we know now in baptism. He was talking about baptism. And how does the, the Spirit play a part in that? Well, our understanding of baptism, as we will study more, is that the water and the Spirit are, are all there. 
there are there are those who will separate. Uh, you can have a water baptism, but then you need a spirit baptism too. You you will come to Jesus, and when was I born again? And you know, a lot of Christians and even uh, generally evangelicals are the ones to say that, or Pentecostals or, char or Charismatics, uh, which is fine for them to understand it that way, but I don't think we have to feel uh, there's anything second rate about any baptism that uh, we have been baptized with because the, the Spirit was present. Uh, and especially if it's an infant baptism, it's an effective baptism for all of your life, and the Spirit was, was there at a, a very, very young age. Uh, so, uh, the way Jesus described the Spirit, do you remember? He said it's like what? We're going to hear it tonight according to the weather reports. It's like the wind, which is another name for Spirit. But he, he wanted to point out, you don't see the wind. So, yeah, like, there's air in here, we don't see the air, but you see the results of the air. You see the branches blow, you can feel it against your face. And that's the way the Spirit is. You're, you're not going to really see it, but you're going to see the effects of it. And this is uh, how God works us in us in that uh, undercover kind of way. That uh, you, um, well, there was uh, that particular moment in the life of the church, which really was the birthday of the church, when, as Jesus promised the disciples before he ascended to heaven, you go to Jerusalem and wait for this Holy Spirit which was always around anyways, but uh, in this one tremendous way, you're going to know it, and it, it happened on uh, the 50th day. Jesus uh, ascended to heaven 40 days after his resurrection. Now on the 50th day, which was uh, the Jewish uh, religious festival of Pentecost, Penta 5, 50, 50 days. Now it, it becomes 50 days after Passover. Now for us, it's 50 days after resurrection. And the spirit came with the, the rush, the sound of a mighty wind and the symbols of the flames on the heads of the disciples. And they were, they were absolutely transformed by that. So there was the, the sound and uh, the, the flames are sort of the, the fire that gets lit in us by the Holy Spirit. I mean, that was one thing that could be seen. But what's seen about the Holy Spirit here is you look at the results. Because there is a Holy Spirit, the Creed says there is a holy Catholic Church. There is a communion of saints. There is a forgiveness of sins. There is a resurrection of the body and a life everlasting. So you didn't see that Spirit, but it, it worked with the Word so that uh, on individual people and then among all those people individually who have been moved by the Holy Spirit, touched by the Holy Spirit, brought to faith by the Holy Spirit, you now become a communion, you become the church, you become saints. Um, and, and saints are those who belong to God, whose sins are forgiven. Then in the article, uh, the explanation of the article, uh, what, what are the results of the Holy Spirit? How do you know the, the Holy Spirit is present? Well, people have been gathered and enlightened and sanctified. Uh, they've been united. Uh, they've been kept in one true faith. Uh, sins are forgiven. We need that forgiveness every day. We are refreshed and renewed every day by the Holy Spirit. Uh, we, we can't get that often enough. Uh, and then in the, in the greatest and uh, final and most effective way on the last day, well, uh, it's uh, the Holy Spirit. Uh, Luther attributes uh, the rising, the resurrection of all saints um, to the Holy Spirit. It will be the coming of Jesus that is the, the last day. So we, we get to live eternally because of the Holy Spirit. And some of that, I consider that very first sentence in the explanation part of that insider language that uh, Lutherans can know. Uh, I believe that I cannot by my own understanding or effort or the way I learned it before they upgraded or modernized the language more, modernized it in 1978. <laughs> I believe that I cannot by my own reason or strength believe in Jesus Christ or come to him. 
but the Holy Spirit has called me by the gospel, enlightened me with his gifts, gifts and sanctified and kept me in the true faith, in the one true faith. So the fact that we have faith is not because we decided to have faith, but the Holy Spirit saw that that opportunity when we were exposed to the good news, to the message, and every uh, every morsel of who we are said, well, that can't possibly be true. Nobody rises from the dead, and maybe we've got uh, esteem problems. We can't believe God would love me that much, and we certainly can't believe that God would do this as a gift. I, I have to do something about it. And that was, was swirling around us, and we're trying to comprehend it. And the Holy Spirit pops in and says, I'm going to make that a faith for you. So you uh, overcame, uh, the Holy Spirit all, overcame all those human uh, arguments against this being true and this being for me. As in the Holy Spirit just uh, molded it and uh, uh, kneaded it and made it a, a faith. That's, that's the Holy Spirit's work. So that's, uh, that's a little over an hour's work here. And I'm trying to keep it to an hour. Can't possibly get everything about this in an hour. So you may have some questions yet. And if you've yeah. got one, I can deal with yet. Yes, Lana. Okay. Uh, so what does creed mean? Do you all... uh, creed means I believe. Mm -hmm. It is a statement of belief. The Latin word is C R E D O which translated means, I believe. That's where we get it from in English. The creed is a statement of belief. Mm -hmm. Can you explain the word redemption and redeemed mm -hmm. in other mm -hmm. terms? Uh, redeemed is, uh, we, we've got uh, the word salvation for being saved from sin and death. Redeemed works into what we said in the, what Luther said in the second article. Um, he saved me and redeemed me. We, we use coupons. We redeem coupons, don't we? So you've got a coupon and you're going to give it for your, your Coke or your water and uh, you get some value for that and then it, then it belongs to you. Uh, that's a, a little bit of our, yeah, a little bit of stretch. Uh, the best explanation is to think of slavery. There were slaves, and uh, they were under the control and power, and the, their whole life was nothing but slavery. But you could buy a slave out of slavery. You could redeem a slave. So that's to buy back is, uh, is redemption. So Jesus bought us back from the power of death so that we can have life. And it is death. I mean, he didn't use gold and silver, as you would expect if you're going to buy a, a slave in you know, an American South and slavery days or in the, the Roman Empire. You could buy a, slavery, a slave and give him or her freedom. So we've, we've been enslaved in sin, and Jesus paid a price, uh, did what it, it takes to bring freedom. Uh, like to just a little extra uh, emphasis um, on what's happening here with God working in our lives. The first article explanation said, God also protects me in time of danger and guards me from all evil. And uh, based on what Lana just asked here about being redeemed, uh, he has freed me from sin and death and the power of the, the devil. Uh, two things that God is doing all the time, protecting us and freeing us. And I think of that in terms of uh, what uh, we in our, especially in our adolescent years, when we're, we're growing up and we're, we're in that tension of uh, we, we want to be free, but we want to be protected too. Uh, the rebellion of the teenage years. I want that freedom, got to test that out. But we, we certainly, truth be told, uh, don't want to be uh, released entirely from that uh, protective 
environment of, of home and family. And so I, I like the way that balances out too. How God deals with us probably always uh, growing up in faith. We're always maturing and you know, some sometimes we can recognize, oh boy, you know, this this is or we can see it in each other, or maybe somebody tells you you've got a mature faith. <laughs> and that's a, a joyful thing to to think we've uh, we we've stopped growing or having to to gain anymore. Uh, that's not something we should be thinking. Let's keep pursuing. Okay. Before I get on another idea and keep you here all night. Let's, anything else? Today? I have one thing. Okay, Tanya. Now you mentioned Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Yes. Did you say those came in a certain order? I mean, I know mm. one person. I know it's God himself. But mm. Did you say that those came in a certain order, or they're not necessarily? Don't have to be in a certain order. Because That's the way just I understood so... it was that the Father was always first, and then the Son mm. came, and then the Holy Ghost. But I don't know. I just know that all three are one. Mm. That's the only way I understand it. All three are one. And then Jesus himself put it in this order, not that it always has to be in this order, but it, because it came out of the mouth of Jesus. Matthew 28, before Jesus ascends to heaven and he gives the great commission to his disciples, go ye, from the King James Version, go ye therefore into all the world, um, teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So because Jesus said it that way, it's been set out as this is the Trinitarian formula. We'll say it this way, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That's the way I've always said it. That's yeah. the way I always understood mm -hmm. it. I didn't know if one came in a certain order or the other did or yeah. didn't. But the only logical mm -hmm. way that I ever saw it was obviously Father, then the Son, and then yeah. the Holy Spirit, which mm -hmm. would have been after he died. Yeah, but, it, you know, like I said, I just kind of was... It doesn't imply that there is any order of power or ascendancy. Because that's what the Athanasian Creed says that I just read. The Father is equal to the Son, Son equal to the Father, and the Spirit, Spirit equal. They are they are all fully God and truly God. So the Athanasian was created by the Catholics? No. Well, that was when there was only one church. Even before there was an Orthodox Church, the split between, uh, let's just call it a night. <laughs> it, it was it was early, still pretty early in Christianity. You mean when the really, Catholics you, separated from the Lutherans and all that stuff and some kind of like that, yeah. Yeah, which was 1517 when Luther oh. began the Reformation that brought about a uh, division. Mm -hmm. So 1,200 years before Martin Luther the Nicene Creed uh, out of the Council of Nicaea said, well, Jesus is truly God and truly human. Uh, but creeds were around before that. Uh, yeah, also that split from uh, Catholic pretty much the same time, right? Uh, with Martin Eastern, Luther? No, no, no. Oh, no, the Eastern, Eastern and Western churches. Uh, even no, in the, in the um, I forget the exact, 11th century. 11th century? Yeah. Oh. That's a date I should remember, but I don't. I remember it, and then it goes away, and then I look it up again. And so, and it, uh, <coughs> so, and, uh, yeah, some of that was, uh, was about the Holy Spirit. So. Okay, ready to call it a night. Let's close with the benediction. The Lord bless us and keep us. The Lord make his face shine upon us and be gracious unto us. The Lord lift up his countenance upon us and give us peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace, serve the Lord. Thanks. Have a restful evening. Yes.